in the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Get ready for that word today to build you up, equip you, and make you what you are supposed to be in Christ. Let me also mention that, you know, uh, as we begin to bring the word today, you need to help me invite friends, tag some people, mobilize some people to come to the dining table. Let's eat together from the table of the Lord. It's very critical. And let me announce quickly before we get in the service. The Abel Damina Online Mentoring Academy begins the second batch from the month of September 2018 to September 2019. And I'll be preach, I'll be ministering and you know training all the mentees throughout the course of one year. It's a time where I will be with you in the class, teach you the word online, you know, answer your questions, give you assignments, because so many times people want me to answer questions. But this is going to be well taught. This is going to be progressive learning. This is going to be a time of training and equipping where I will teach you the, the message of Christ unveil the scriptures to you you know break down every aspect of the doctrine of christ and build you up in the knowledge of the lord jesus i will answer your questions i will give you assignments recommend resources for you to get it's going to be 12 months of spiritual development you don't want to stay out of it it begins from september to september 2019 registration closes on the 30th of august so if you send a mail today to the email address on the screen right now dr abel damina at yahoo.com my office will rush you all the forms that you need so you can feel return to enable you register before the 30th of august help me spread the news let people know what god is doing in this season an army is rising all over the world that will proclaim christ and demonstrate his finished work like never before i'm excited to connect with you in the class in the mentoring academy the second thing i want to announce is abuja abuja Get ready for the Believer's Heritage Conference coming up in the city of Abuja, the 30th, the 31st of August, the 1st and the 2nd of September. There are going to be days that will change your life for all of you in the Abuja area. In fact, the theme of that meeting is you've already got it. Stop the struggle to get it. You've already got it. Stop the struggle to get it. <laughs> it's going to be four days. I'm telling you, you will never recover from the impact of the revelation of God's word. Help me invite people, mobilize people all over the Abuja axis. Let's connect together from the 30th, the 31st of August, the 1st and the 2nd of September. There's a phone number on the screen to call for further directions and details of time and other, other things. But look, it's going to be one meeting in Abuja that will change your life forever. I'm looking forward to connecting with all of you in Abuja come the 30th, 31st, 1st, and 2nd of September. I'm excited, friends. Tell people about what God is doing. Fasten your seatbelts right now. Let me take you into a gospel adventure, into the service, where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. Now, we've took time to establish, number one, that there are certain fundamentals that we don't even argue about. Number one, Jesus rules from the dead. That one is not up for debate. Number two, he was born of a virgin. Number three, Jesus is God who became a man. That one is not up for debate. That the death of Christ was substitutionary sacrifice. His death was my death. His burial was my burial. His resurrection was my resurrection. His ascension was my ascension. His glorification is my glorification. It's not up for debate. We don't even negotiate that. That is where we begin from. And we took time to establish a number of things. If you were here during the teachings, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to go through the whole fundamentals. I'm just going to shoot because I've got quite some distance and I must finish it today. Because from Sunday, we're beginning with Soteria. Somebody say, I hear you. So are you ready? All right, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. Now, we have seen the word deceive, deceive, deceive. When Jesus was talking, he talked about deceive. Brother Paul talked about deceive. We saw that, uh, you know, uh, Peter talked about deceive and all the apostles. They were very big on deceive. All right, put it back for me. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, this is where a lot of people have had their confusion. And this is where a lot of people have had issues with the issue of one antichrist, one world government that is going to come to take over the whole world you know and, and conquer nations and take over and all of that it is from that that verse 
that the people come with all of those things. And we're going to demystify that within the next few minutes. Now, uh, Jesus said, let no man deceive you. Um, Paul said, let no man deceive you and all of them. James, John, and all of them. Now, but take note. Put that scripture back for me because we're going to reconstruct a few things. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come. So that day shall not come. It's not in the original. That's why it's in italics. That day shall not come. It's not in the original. That already shows you the bias of the translators. That the translators, when they were translating, translated it verse with a particular day in mind. That already shows you their bias. Because that's not in the original text. But they added that. So because of that, we're going to do a lot of reconstruction because we already have seen their bias. Their bias is about a particular day. That is in their mind. All right, put up the scripture for me again. Let's read. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed. The son of perdition. Next verse. Who opposed and exalted himself above all that is called God. All that is worshipped. So that he, as God, seated in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Next verse. Now, just before I go to the next verse, did you see temple there? That he sits in a temple. Now, the next question you want to ask yourself, which temple? Which temple is he sitting in? There's no more temple. All temples have been abolished in Christ. So which temple is he going to sit on? Certainly not your body because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So that already puts another question mark in that verse. Which temple? Jesus ended the temple worship. When, he came, when it was time for him to die, he said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. Since after that, when he rose from the dead, that was the end of temple worship. But now this verse talks about a temple where this guy is going to sit wherever this guy is. Are we in the house? But if you pay attention carefully to the previous teachings I have done on the Antichrist, we saw that Jesus warned about persecution. Did we see that? Persecution. He warned about false teachers. He also warned about false prophets. Paul warned us of these also. Those that oppose the gospel. And that's consistent. Jesus, false prophet, false teachers, persecution. The apostles, false prophets, false teachers, and those that will oppose the gospel. And of course, the opposition of the gospel is persecution. So there's consistency in that thought pattern that we saw them present, the apostles and Jesus. Now, just put your finger there. If your Bible was mine, you'll just put a little note there, just, just a little you know, note with your pen so you know where you stop. Flip over to Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So again, you see persecutions and tribulations. So obviously, when Brother Paul was writing to the church at Thessalonia, there was persecution and opposition and tribulation going on. He wasn't talking of a futuristic persecution. He wasn't talking about a futuristic tribulation. Put it back. Let us see that scripture again. Pay attention to the tenses. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God. For your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure this is not a future persecution and this is not a future tribulation the church as at that time was going through persecution and tribulation and brother paul was saying that they endure that they're enduring that persecution and tribulation give me verse 5 of the same scripture which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of god that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you will also suffer. Did he say for which you will suffer? What did he say? For which you also suffer. All right. So now he says there will be suffering for the gospel. That the gospel attracts suffering. At that particular time, that church was going through a time of suffering for the gospel. Verse 6 of the same chapter. 
seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. This is one scripture that has been grossly abused. Now when preachers read that, they now take it and conclude that God wants us to recompense tribulation to people that trouble us. So we start praying judgmental prayers. Fall and die. Be roasted. It will never be well with you. May thunder fire your mother. You know, all kinds of prayers. You know, flog them silly. Let them go out and never come back. You know, all kinds of prayer because they saw a scripture and took the verse out of context. So what was Brother Paul communicating when he said it was a righteous thing for God to recompense tribulation to those who trouble you? The Greek word there recompense is antipodidomai. A-N-T-I-P-O-D-I-D-O-M-I. -I -I. It's like a return. It means a return that somebody reaps what he is doing that these people who are persecuting the church will reap what they are doing they will reap it it's not god that's going to give it to them within their action is repercussion you didn't hear that within their action is repercussion let me ask all of you a question you walk to a child and you say to that child don't put your hand in the fire if you put your hand in the fire, the fire will burn you. And then you walk away, and the child goes in and puts his finger in the fire, and the fire burns the child. Did you burn the child? Who burned the child? The fire. Because the fire has repercussion in it. So the tribulation there was a recompense for what they are doing, which was, going to, which was within their activity that they were engaged in. In order for you to understand, we're going to read a lot of scriptures that open that recompense as harvesting what they are doing, which is inherent in the activity. Luke 14, 14. And thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. They cannot recompense thee, you shall be recompensed. That's the word antipodidomai. Another scripture is Romans eleven thirty five. Or who had first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. It shall be recompensed, it shall be returned unto him again. The book of Romans 12, 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Did you see that? Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. I will repay, recompense. The book of 1 Thessalonians 3, 9. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? Hebrews 10, 36. You have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. That is the same word for recompense. So we saw that they were going to get what they want. That when they persecute you, out of that persecution, there is a recompense for them of their action. It was not a separate prayer for vengeance. In verse 7 of that Thessalonians, where we are, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven. Now take note of that. That's a key verse. If you miss that one, you shouldn't have come to service today. Put it up again. Take note. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed. Who shall be revealed? So the message here is the revelation of Jesus. That no matter the persecution, no matter the trial, no matter the suffering, no matter the tribulation, there is comfort coming. And that comfort is the revelation of Jesus. The revelation of Jesus. That was the message of brother Paul to the church at Thessalonians comforting them in the midst of tribulation, in the midst of trial. Why? Because the church is only called to reveal Christ or teach about Christ. We don't have any other message. Our message is the revelation of Jesus. The revelation of who? Of Jesus. Give me the next verse. In flaming fire, oh, pay attention. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God 
and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a simple question. Who are those that did not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? Sorry? Unbelievers. Has the gospel been presented to them? And they rejected the gospel? So now, he says, when Jesus shall be revealed, those who rejected the gospel will have vengeance with fire. That means the revelation of Jesus will be the judgment of the unbeliever who rejected Jesus. That's what that scripture is communicating. That when Jesus shall be revealed, there will be judgment for those who rejected the gospel. Put it up again. Let me read the two verses and I want you to pay attention. Verse 7 and verse 8. And to you are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. It didn't talk about the revelation of an antichrist. It talks about the revelation of the Lord Jesus. That's the only revelation we are called to unveil. And to you are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. All right? Next verse. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and who are those that know not God, and that believe not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They did not obey the gospel. They rejected the gospel. So they know not God. And these are the people that trouble us. People who don't know God. And then he now tells us Jesus shall be revealed. And when he's revealed, there shall be fire to judge those people. All right? Next verse, verse 9. Are you following? Verse 9. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction? What kind of destruction? Everlasting destruction. From the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now the word vengeance is the Greek word ekdisis. E-K-D-I-S-I-S. is used for justice. What is just to someone? Giving someone what he deserves by justice. Giving someone, that's vengeance, what he deserves by justice. So brother Paul is not discussing sin. Uh -uh. In this scripture, brother Paul is not talking about sin. He is talking about a man who despises the cure for sin. He is talking about a man who despises the cure for sin. The issue here is not sin. The issue here is a man who despises the cure for sin. What is the cure for sin? Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. When a man despises Jesus, he has rejected the cure for sin because Jesus is the cure for sin. Are we together here? So brother Paul was dealing with God's sacrifice in Christ for sin. The sacrifice of God in Christ for sin. And these people are saying no to that sacrifice. They are saying no to that sacrifice. They obey not the gospel. What is the gospel? Jesus died. He was buried. On the third day, he rose again for your justification. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. So they rejected salvation. And because of that, there will be a recompense. Because they rejected salvation, there will be a recompense. Since they rejected God's cure for sin, they have to provide their own cure. And man doesn't have a cure for sin. So the wages of sin is dead. Recompense. Recompense. The wages of sin. Recompense is dead. So since they rejected the gospel, they rejected God's cure for sin, that is why he brought the flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you are with me, shout, I hear you. All right. So the justice is not God doing something. The justice is actually God doing nothing. The justice is not God doing something. The justice is God doing nothing. Since we gave you the gospel, you rejected the gospel, there's nothing more God can do. So when God says, I cannot do anything anymore, the absence of God is the presence of justice. You didn't hear that. The absence of God is the presence of the punishment or the justice. 
Because as long as the gospel is still coming, the day of salvation is open, the mercy of God is, is at, 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 in operation. The grace of God. But when God now says, well, since you don't want all the offer, I have been patient with you long ago. In the days of Noah, how many years did Noah preach the gospel? 120 years of long suffering. And God will say, all right, since you've rejected the only offer I have for you, well, you, you look for something that you think is good for you. And because man doesn't have what to offer, a man doesn't have anything to give, then the judgment of God comes on a man who rejected the only offer that God gave to him. All right? I said, all right. Then look at verse 9. There's something, I'm dealing with a lot of theological issues there. Look at verse 9. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence? From the presence. The word there is not from, actually. The, the word there is away from the presence. That's the way it is in the original. The reason why they will be punished is because they are away from the presence of God. It's not as if the punishment is going to travel from God's presence. No. The reason why they will be punished is because they are away. They turned away from God's offer. And when they turned away from God's offer, God's absence became the presence of judgment. Teaching good? God's absence became the presence of judgment. Now, we're still interpreting that chapter because that's where a lot of confusion came to the body of Christ. It, God's presence is salvation. Is that true? Power City, talk to me. God's presence is salvation. Is that true? Then what is God's absence? Destruction. God's presence is salvation. God's absence is destruction. So when God made the offer and his presence was looking for how you will accept the offer, there was salvation waiting for you. But the day God turns his face and says, well, it's over, I can't wait anymore, and he turns his, his face away, what will happen to that person? Destruction. It is called vengeance. Amen. I'm glad you're catching fast. So brother Paul in Thessalonians is discussing those who oppose the gospel. Those who oppose the gospel. Look at verse 10 now. Verse 10. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints. And to be admired in all them that believe. Because our testimony among you was believed in that day. When he will come. The word come is the word ekomai, E-K-O-M-A-I, ekomai. It's not to come in, it's actually to future. When he says when he shall come, it's not saying God is, Jesus is going to come into you. What it means by when he shall come is ekomai. And in, in the Greek, that word ekomai has two meanings. The first meaning is to come into you. The second meaning is when he shall future or be manifest. When it shall future. So now, in proper Bible study, you have to look at the context and look at the pattern to be able to select which of those words fit into that verse. And we know that Jesus lives in you. So he's not going to come into you because he lives in you. So if he's going to come, he's going to manifest from you. So the second coming of Christ is not somebody coming from the sky. Ah, I'm running faster than my legs now. All right? It's going to be a futuring. Glory. So if you are waiting for a being to come from the sky and enter you, you better not allow uh, a foreign spirit. All of God is where? Uh -huh. somebody shall cry in me the hope of glory oh my goodness I'm getting excited because this thing is sweeting me already he had already told you that, that, that the coming is a revelation the revelation of Jesus did I emphasize that he has already told you that that's a revelation so revelation means to open what is covering it when we say something has been revealed, we mean something covered it. So when we remove what covered it, what is it? Revelation is the unveiling. The unveiling. Hallelujah. 
as we speak right now, the body of believers is concealing Jesus. As we speak right now, the body of believers is concealing Jesus. We, our body conceals Jesus. They can't see Jesus because our body conceals him and is living in us. So the coming of Jesus... The coming of Jesus is not a coming to enter. It is a manifestation from inside out. Teaching good here. The first time he came, he came for us. The second time he's coming, he's coming with us. You didn't hear that. Uh -huh. The first time he came, he came for us. The second time he is coming, he is coming with us and through us. Christ in the church. So Jesus is not coming from the clouds. Brother Paul said he shall come from the clouds. That was a metaphor. It was not literal. It was a metaphor. So what is actually dealing with here is the appearance, the manifestation of Christ who is concealed in the believer coming out in his full glory for the world to see through the believer. Teaching good? Yeah. That's the second coming. Now, that's important. Keep it somewhere. It will be useful to you in a few minutes. Verse 10 of the same scripture where we are, Second Thessalonians. When he shall come, church, when he shall come to be glorified where? Where? Where will the glorification take place? Inside the saints. Where are the saints? Is he coming from the sky? Where is he coming from? From within the saints to be glorified. Woo! Getting blessed. To be glorified in the saints. So where is the revelation? To us or through us? Through us. Alright? Look at that verse 10 again. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. Because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Admire there is the Greek word thumazo. T-H-A-U-M-A-Z-O. Tomazo, it means to marvel. It speaks of a miracle, a sign, or a wonder. To be admired, to create a marvel, to show forth a sign. So Jesus is not coming to the saints. What we call the coming of Christ is not to us. It is through us. The coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ, or technically, the third coming of Christ, is not to us. It's through us. Through us. Glory. An unveiling of Christ. Now, verse 11 now. Look at verse 11 and see what Brother Paul will say. Wherefore also, we pray always for you, that our God will count you worthy. Now, there's, there's a translation issue there. Our God is not going to count you worthy. He has already counted you worthy. All right? He sees you fit. Worthiness is what God has done in Christ. So what will be the prayer? The prayer will be in verse 12. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the prayer, may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the prayer. That was the prayer. Because the believer is already counted worthy. Alright? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you brethren. Beloved of the Lord because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. That one is not a prayer because that's what God has done. That's what God has done, verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath. So it's not a prayer. That's what God has already done. So the prayer is chapter 1, verse 12. That's the prayer. 
that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Can somebody shout amen to that prayer? Amen. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1. Now we beseech you brethren, touch your neighbor's leg and shout brethren. I know he's not a brethren but uh, he can represent a brethren. Brethren is all of us. All right? Now I beseech you brethren by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. That word coming is the Greek word parousia. Parousia. P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A. -A. Parousia. P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A. -A. It's another word that has a general use meaning anywhere you see the word parousia you can only interpret it based on the context of usage the context of usage it could be like you're coming a movement towards or it could be talking about a physical appearance around uh, that word parousia is used in matthew 24 3 Matthew 24, verse 3, verse 7, verse 31, verse 39. Let me see if I can read it quickly. I have a lot to do, but let's see. Uh, Matthew 24, verse 3. And he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples said unto him privately, saying, Tell us what shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? Parousia. Parousia. Now, you can read the rest at home. Verse, verse 7, verse 31, and verse, verse 39. Another scripture is 1 Corinthians 15, 23. Paul used it for rapture. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruit afterward, then at Christ at his coming. Next verse. Then come at the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. When he shall put down all rule and all authority and power. He's talking about parousia here. Parousia. Look at 1 Corinthians 16, 17. I am glad of the coming of Stephanas and Fortunatus and Achaicus. For that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. Their coming has supplied what was lacking. Meaning their presence, they are coming. All right, the same word parousia, Second Corinthians seven six to seven, parousia. Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus, the parousia of Titus, verse seven. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told you. When he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. The coming of Titus, the presence of Titus. So that word parousia is also used for the presence of somebody. Second Corinthians 10.10 10. For these letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible his bodily parousia his presence parousia all right someone's presence philippians 1 26 we're dealing with exigencies here that your rejoicing may be more abundant in jesus christ for me by my coming to you my parousia to you so if you're coming to it means an action is intended or if I say the coming of pastor praise, what I'm saying is the presence of pastor praise. So it's one of the two. Either coming where an action is intended, coming to, or the coming of. The coming of deals with presence. The coming to deals with an activity. Are we in the house? So the word parousia could be used in any of the two instances depending on the context where it is applied in scripture. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 For what is our hope or joy or crown or rejoicing? And not even ye in the presence, in the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming, at his parousia, parousia, parousia. 
in the same verse at his coming so parousia can be action of somebody coming or an appearance first thessalonians 3 13 to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before god even our father at the parousia of our lord jesus christ with all his saints he is not coming to us he's coming with us did you see that hey power city did you see that put that scripture back again kabatole to the end he may establish your heart unblameable in holiness before god even our father at the coming of our lord jesus christ how with all his saints so the second coming of christ is is how to us with us with us so the second coming of christ is not a being coming to us it is we and christ manifesting glory to god doesn't that just bless you already while some people are waiting for jesus to come and they're waiting for him to come to them that means they have not read where we read two weeks ago lo i am with you always he doesn't lie he's in you now so the coming of christ will be out of you tabaya somebody shall christ in me the hope of glory say with me christ lives on my inside christ and i our second coming So when somebody say, will you be raptured? Will you be ready when the Lord shall come? Tell him it is you I should be asking. Because I have been ready long ago. He's not coming for me. He's coming with me. That already cancels whether you are fit for rapture or not. Is it getting clear? All right, let's get back to the world. Let's get back. I'm getting excited because this, this gets me happy. I love to hear about me and Christ manifesting together. Woo! Somebody's not excited. Are you happy? Second Peter 1 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we are eyewitnesses of his majesty. This was Peter talking about the appearing of the Lord Jesus in human form. The coming of our Lord Jesus means salvation in this verse. Or the appearing of Jesus in human form. So get back. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1 where we were, we've been studying and then we digressed. 2 Thessalonians 2 1. Now we beseech you brethren by the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ. And by our gathering together unto him. Question. Is Jesus with the church? Let me hear a living power city answer. All right, is Jesus with the church? Yes. Is Jesus in the saints? Yes. Is he inside the saints? Yes. All right, is he coming to the world or coming to the church? Coming with, with the saints. He's coming to the world with. Is he coming to the saints? Where is he coming to? The world. With who? With the saints. So Jesus and I, our second coming. And we call that the blessed hope. So if there was a teaching inside your head, contrary to what you are hearing right now, it should have gone to the dustbin. Glory to God. Some of those garbage, I was taught it and I taught it. But I was not a good student so of that type. Somebody asked me what about eschatology. I said, me, I don't do a lot of eschatology. I only do the eschatology that assures me my salvation. I don't have time for, for, for fallacies. I stay with the word. Amen. Amen. All right. So Jesus is in the church. Coming to the world through the church. Jesus is in the church coming to the world through the church and that is what we call the manifestation of the sons of god that's the manifestation that's the full disclosure 
Hey! That word manifestation is the word, the full disclosure, the unveiling, the full unveiling of the sons of God. The full disclosure. Amen. Glory to God. And John says, when, we shall, when he shall appear, we shall be as he is. Is that what John said? 1 John 3. 3 verse 1. When he shall appear, we shall be as he is, because as he is, so are we. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1 and 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. Let me deal with the word gathering. It is the word Episunagage. This is how to spell it. E P I S U N A G A G E. Episunagage. To come together. It is used in Hebrews 10 25. Do not dismiss the assembling of yourselves together. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 now. Let no man deceive you. Paul reinforces what he said earlier. Let no man deceive you by any means. Let no man deceive you by any means. So, for that day shall not come again. Did we say the addition of day shows us the bias? All right. The bias of who? The translators. The bias of the translators. Okay. Already we see that there. Now, let's proceed. Verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed. The son of perdition. So brother Paul now uses a strong word here. And that word is exapatua. Exapatua. That word deceive is the word exapatua. E-X-A-P-A-T-A-O. It means complete deception. That's the way scholar call it. Complete deception means you are thoroughly deceived when he said let no man deceive you he was dealing with complete deception where a man is thoroughly deceived you can see that in romans 7 11 romans 16 18 give me romans 16 18 for they that are such serve not our lord jesus christ but their own belly and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Complete deception. First Corinthians 3.18 Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Complete deception. Self-deception. Second Corinthians 11.3 Brother Paul uses for Satan's deception. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Same way he deceived Eve. First Timothy 2.14. Same word, deception. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So the deception here is not just a mere error. Where they say, well, the pastor didn't know how to teach faith, so he was teaching faith, not balance. No, that one is error. This deception is complete deception against Christ. Complete deception against Christ. It's an intent to take a man away from God's word, from God's truth, and from the gospel. Not just an error. A deception that takes a man away from the gospel. All right, so he now says there will be a falling away first. Give me that Thessalonians where we are. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. A falling away. Now, that word falling away, there is no fall at all in that word. You didn't hear me. There is no fall. It's actually the word apostasia. Apostasia. It means to go away, not to fall down. Apostasia. To go away, not to fall down. The word here means to take away. So it's not like there will be great deception and many believers will fall away. 
Uh uh. That's not what he's talking about. That's not what he's talking about. There are two things Brother Paul is teaching here from chapter 1, from all the exigencies we have done. Number one, there will be a revelation of Jesus. Is that true? And where will the revelation take place? In the saints. And he will be glorified where? In the saints. Number two, there will be a destruction of those who do not believe the gospel. The revelation of Jesus will bring about the judgment for those who do not believe the gospel. Please stay with those two thoughts. Stay with them as you follow me. So when he says a falling away, many of the pronouns that were used from the Greek, we are singular. So many times, when you follow a pronoun from the Greek that is singular, you must stay with the context. The context will help you. Many times in study. So except there come a falling away, or a taking away, or a removal a removal the elect there will be a removal not a falling away from Christ you didn't hear that a removal or what we call the rapture or what we call a, a, a taking away not a falling the elect don't fall it's not consistent with salvation. The elect don't fall. So that means it's a translation. It's a syntax problem there. Are you following? Yeah. We are not of the drawback. <laughs> Amen. Uh -huh. So it, it, it's a syntax problem there. So he now says in verse 3. Verse 3 of that chapter. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Except, except, if not, except, or if not. That's the word for that, except. All right? Now, what will be the deception? The deception will be there is no revelation of Jesus. That's the opposition. The deception will be that there is no revelation of Jesus. Because the deception has to be about Jesus. And the revelation we have read so far from the Thessalonian later, Brother Paul, is the revelation of Jesus. So first of all, is the revelation of Jesus. In the original, that's how he puts it. The revelation of Jesus first. Alright? Now, go back to chapter 1, verse 7. Let me show you something. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Verse 9. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power? Verse 10. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Now, he deals with the man of sin and he calls him the son of perdition. Number one, the revelation of Jesus. Number two, the man of sin. That word man is a Greek word. An, a, anthropos. Anthropos. A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O-S. Anthropos. It is either singular or it is used for, for a collective usage. So when he said the man of sin... The man of sin there will be a word used for a collective usage. The man of sin will represent the man of sin. Not man as in singular. The man of sin will represent the man of sin. Are you in the house? The man of sin. Or the man of perdition. Remember the revelation of Jesus and those who rejected the gospel. The man of sin. 
the revelation of Jesus from chapter 1 where we started discussing that the key revelation of the gospel is the revelation of Jesus. Now, if you remember I said that the revelation of Jesus will reveal the destruction of those who oppose the gospel. Did I say that? Okay. Or those who disobey the gospel. So let's look at the word man. Man. Man as in collective use because we're dealing with the man of sin. Let me ask you. When it says man shall not live by bread alone. Is it man as in singular or man as collective? Exactly. So man for man. The man of sin for men of sin. Yes, sir. It's not dealing with one particular man. It's dealing with a group of men who rejected the gospel. Are we together here? Yes, Remember again, what are we dealing with? The Bible truth about the Antichrist. We're on a journey here. It's a bit technical tonight, but it's good for your health. Makes you think. <clears throat> now, that man of sin is the word sin there is ammonia a r m o n i a ammonia which is the word for iniquity that word iniquity is a persistent disobedience iniquity a persistent disobedience and opposition against the truth from chapter one brother paul was dealing with revelation of jesus and then he said the revelation of Jesus will be the judgment of the man of sin or the son of perdition. Those who oppose the gospel. And it is those who oppose the gospel who bring tribulation to us. Those that oppose the gospel, they are the ones that persecute us. Now ammonia used for iniquity. Let's look at where it has been used. Romans 4, 7. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven. Romans 6, 19. Ammonia. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. Ammonia. Titus 2, 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. First John 3, 4, ammonia, iniquity. Whosoever committed sin transgressed also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Ammonia. All right. However, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, look at the way brother Paul puts it. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Hey. So, what fellowship has unrighteousness with unrighteousness? Question. Unrighteousness there, is it referring to an attitude or men? Men. Who are righteous? Men. Who are unrighteous? Men. So, when he says, what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, what he's simply saying is, what fellowship has men who are righteous with men who are unrighteous? Again, the use of the word man. That's what I'm dealing with. The man of sin. The son of perdition. He's not talking of an individual. He's referring to people that have opposed the gospel. Or people that have disobeyed the gospel. If you're with me on the same page, shout a powerful amen. amen. All right, so let's move on. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. That book, Thessalonians, is critical because that's where a lot of people, a lot of garbage comes from. Who's opposed and exalted himself? This man of sin, this man of perdition, opposes and exalted themselves. Go ahead. Above all that is called God. All that is worship. So that he, remember we're dealing with man here, but man has in collective use. He as God, seated in the temple of God. Again, which temple? Because temple worship is gone. And it will never come again. Somebody said, I mean, you know, I just went to Israel. They're already clearing the bush where they're going to rebuild the temple of Solomon. I said, for who? 
He said, don't you believe in Bible prophecy? I said, any Bible prophecy that is not targeted at Christ is fallacy. For who are they building it for? There is no scripture that says Jesus is coming back to live in a, in a temple built with hands. That's not. Theologically, intellectually, scripturally, doctrinally, it doesn't make sense. Destroy this temple. Eh? And in three days, I will raise it up. Was the temple destroyed? Yes, sir. Did he raise it up in three days? Yes, sir. And they were thinking of a physical temple, but he spoke about the temple of his body. Mm. Are we together here? Yes, sir. Meaning there's no more physical temple does not matter anymore. Yes. You shall neither in Jerusalem nor in this temple. The time cometh. And now is when true worshippers shall worship the Father. Oh yes, in Israel they may be clearing a bush to build a temple because they have no revelation. But we are not going to fall in the same trap. We know better. Your body is the eternal home. You didn't hear that. How long? Show me my body is the eternal home of God. He will live with me, abide in me forever. In your village, what is forever? He didn't say he will live in you until Jerusalem rebuilds the temple of Solomon. <laughs> he will live in you forever. Shout glory. glory. Where is he living forever? You see how glorious you are? You see how expensive you are? That no, 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 even if all the money of the oil wells in Africa are used to build a temple, it's not good enough for God. That's how expensive. Kabatalaba, Bula Takaba, Zozo Zozo Menengele. I want to run around this building. I want to run around because I'm feeling this day. He's living in me for how long? And his second coming is going to be through me. Glory. He will be glorified in me. Hallelujah. I am in him justified. Shout glory. Hey. Can you feel what I feel tonight? Woo. So there's no physical temple. So that's why that scripture has to be looked at critically. Remember from the beginning we already established the bias of the translators. Alright, so we have to carefully look at that Thessalonians. Now we are not saying that the Bible has anything wrong. Especially since our core fundamental doctrine has not been messed with. The Bible has it clear in black and white. That Jesus died, he was buried on the third day, he rose for my justification. No compromise, no, no translation problem. The core issues of scripture have no translation problem. Great is the mystery of godliness that God is manifest. In the flesh those are the things that make christianity christianity yes sir this one we're learning now is for growth yes, sir. see i hear you I hear. i'm not hearing you say i hear you I hear. the core is already settled yeah. but we have to interpret the rest because all scriptures are given for they are profitable for doctrine reproof correction instruction in righteousness that the man of god perfect truly furnished unto that's all we do interpretation here and interpretation is not because the bible has a problem it's because of syntax second thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4 <clears throat> who opposed it and exalted himself above all that is called god all that is worshiped so that he has God seated in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now go back to verse 3. Let, let me deal with perdition. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away for us, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The man of sin is the son of perdition. So let's deal with the word perdition. Apole. 
apole it's a p o l e i a that's the greek word for perdition apole faith of people who disobey the gospel perdition is the faith of people who disobey the gospel you can see it in ephesians 2 1 to 3 give me verse 3 among them also we are all had our conversation in time past in the loss of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and we are by nature the children of wrath even as others we were children of wrath disobedient to the gospel and that's consistent in paul's writing ephesians 5 6 let no man deceive you with vain words for because of these things cometh the wrath of god upon the children of disobedience disobedience to what to the gospel another one colossians 3 6 consistent in brother paul's writings for which things sake the wrath of god cometh on the children of disobedience consistent 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 in the writings of brother paul so there is a collective use of words for those who don't believe the gospel that word is perdition Perdition, a polar, a state of no revelation or a state of no salvation. Matthew 7 13, you will see Jesus. Enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in their heart. Narrow is the way. Talking about Christ. Broad is the way. Talking about all kinds of ways, religions. Are you here? How many of you have read that the Bible says two will be sleeping, one will be taken, the other will be left? Have you read it? So if your husband and wife in church, one is taken, who will be left? Because sometimes you hear the wife say, me, I will go, you are the one that will be left. And some of the ones say, May I will, I will be gone. You are the one that will be left. But what Jesus was talking about there was persecution. He said, Persecution is going to come. And he said, One of you will be killed while the other will escape. That's what he was talking about. He wasn't talking of rapture. Go read the context, the pretext, and the posttext. You will see that what he was talking about there was persecution. That when persecution will come, because of the heat of persecution, one of you will be killed. That's the taking. And the other will escape. That's the left. He's not talking of rap. He's talking of persecution. So always read the Bible in context. Don't read verses. Read paragraphs. You didn't hear that. Don't read verses. Read paragraphs. So you follow the thought pattern. So you understand the context from the pretext and the posttext. Say, I hear you. It makes it easy for you to know because the Bible is a book of context. And in Bible interpretation, context is king context is key you will hear a lot of this in bible school next week amen, amen. you will learn so much god punished the devil john 17 12 judas is called the son of perdition the son of perdition while i was with them in the world i kept them in my name in thy name those that thou gavest me i have kept and none of them is lost but the son of perdition the son of perdition. Judas never believed the gospel. Never. He walked with Jesus. He carried the bag of money. He was always there. He kissed Jesus, but he never believed the gospel. There are people in churches that have not believed the gospel. In fact, Judas was among those that went to do miracles. And the 17 returned with joy. Judas was among them. Judas is among those who said, the demons obeyed us in your name. So that's why Jesus said, some will come on that day and say, in your name, I raised the dead. In your name, I did miracles. And he will tell them, depart from me. I never knew you. You were never born again. I never, me and you never connected. I never knew you ever. You were lost eternally. And you were never found from the beginning. It's not like, oh, well, well, you know, on the, on, on the last, on the last day, on the last, on the last day, only true believer shall be. What, what is true believer? You're either a believer or a non believer. It's not a true believer. <laughs> 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 
Which one are you? Believer. Say, I'm a believer. believer. Have you ever seen true believer in the Bible? Is that a believer or non-believer? Which one is true believer? Religion is wicked. Judas never believed. Judas and Jesus never had a relationship. So there's nothing like saying, sometimes when you see they will raise your name. When you repent, they will write your name. All that is, is lack of sound Bible understanding. He that believeth shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Somebody shout, I'm a believer. Amen. So Terry is next week. We'll, we'll, talk, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. we'll do salvation brutally in this house. Are you excited? If you're excited, shout, I'm excited. So Judas was a son of perdition. He never believed. And he's not the only one. There are also sons of perdition. Those that oppose the gospel. Those that have not believed the gospel. Romans 9.42 is another one. Acts 8.20 So perdition is used for those who have not believed the gospel. So in consistency with the writing of brother Paul and Jesus, he couldn't have been talking about a singular person. For consistency. Jesus always talk, talked about a, peop, a deception that was going to come from different false prophets and false teachers. Paul talked about people coming to deceive. So they wouldn't have been talking about people coming to deceive and then they now single out one person. That's not consistent. Because we're dealing with this thing called Antichrist. Say I hear you. So we have men of perdition or men of unrighteousness. Philippians 1.28 And in nothing terrified by your adversaries. Did you see adversaries? Is it plural or singular? Plural. Which is to them an evident token of perdition. But to you of salvation and that of God. So perdition is the opposite of salvation. Men of perdition are those who disobey the gospel. And Brother Paul spoke about that in 2 Thessalonians 1, where we read previously. Now look at Philippians 3.19. Whose end is destruction? Whose God is their belly? Whose glory is in their shame? Who mind earthly things? Is this a futuristic verse or a, pre or a present past verse? Present past. Whose God is their belly? Not whose God will be their belly. And Paul said this in his time. Those people already there in Paul's time. It was about men opposing them at that time. First Timothy 6.19 Glory. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Next verse. Oh Timothy, keep that which is committed to their trust. Avoid profane and vain babbling and oppositions of science falsely so called. There are things you stay away from. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets, plural or singular, also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers, plural or singular, among you, who privately shall bring in damnable her heresies. Even denying the Lord that bought them. And bring upon themselves swift destruction. Bring upon themselves what? Hebrews 10, 39. Hebrews 10. But we are not of them who drop back unto perdition. Somebody shout, I am one in that number. But of them that believe. So anybody drawing back is called a son of perdition is it getting clear uh-huh so that scripture where i was talking about perdition it was not singular it was perdition for plural for those who do not believe the gospel now if you pay attention anywhere the bible talks about revelation or apocalypsis 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 that's another word for revelation we have seen parousia now we're looking at apocalypsis. Alright? Now anywhere you see the word apocalypsis is specifically for Jesus. Specifically. Apocalypsis is not used for anybody else. Parousia has two different meanings and I showed you and usages. But apocalypsis 
is only for Jesus. And I will show you in a second. It's only used for Jesus. Apocalypsis. A-P-O-C-A-L-U-P-S-I-S. Apocalypse. It means revelation. It is not used for seeing. It is not used for those that oppose the gospel. It can only be used for Christ. And it's consistent with what Brother Paul taught. Apocalypsis. 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. Who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worship. That's where they keep saying Antichrist. But from what we have seen, this Antichrist sitting on a temple is not consistent in scripture. Okay? So, the best way to describe that will be one who opposes anti kemai anti kemai a n t i k e i m e i the place where you will see that word anti kemai used is in luke 21 15 i give you a mouth and a wisdom that your enemies cannot resist nor gain say anti kemai first corinthians 16 9 for a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. Galatians 5.17 Adversary, contrary. For the flesh lusted against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, contrary. Contrary. Anti-command. Philippians 1.28-29 Brother Paul also spoke about this in his letters. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries. Adversaries adversaries next verse by your adversaries for unto you it is given in the behalf of christ not only to believe on him but also to suffer for his sake all right first timothy 1 10 for one among us for them that defile themselves with mankind for men stealers for liars for perjured persons and if there be any other thing that is contrary so sound doctrine and take a mind. All right, used for opposition to the gospel. Give me that first Timothy 5 14 again. It's something I'm looking for. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give them occasion to the adversary, to the adversary to speak reproach, reproachfully. Reproach, opposition to the gospel. So it's not a being appearing from the sky. No, perdition is an opposition to the gospel. If it's clear, say I hear you. Because I'm taking down to give you overwhelming evidence in scripture. So this guy, or this perdition, or disobedience to the gospel, is an opposition against the message, opposition against the preacher of the word, opposition against God, and opposition against anyone that is devoted to God. In 2 Thessalonians 1 8, he now gives us a background to that opposition. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They oppose the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2 5 to 6. Let's see who is being revealed. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. Next verse. And now you know what withhold it, that he might be revealed in his time. Now, as intelligent students who follow the entire exegesis, who is being revealed? Huh? Christ. So from the context of Thessalonians, who is being revealed? Christ. So anywhere we see revealed, who are we looking at? Christ. So back to, to this verse. Very good. Give me that scripture again. The last one I read. Bless your heart. And now we know what we told her that he might be revealed in his time. Who is to be revealed? Jesus. All right. Now, the word withhold is the word kecho in the Greek. K-E-T-C-H-O. To take a stand. 